Uh, well, what a cool title for a, for a series, Human Being, Being Human. Uh, some of the deepest questions, some of the questions uh, that many of us have asked, at least since we were uh, old enough and complex enough to ask such questions. Uh, so what does it mean to be human? Uh, well, here's, here's one approach, uh, an approach that I think is called the capacities approach by philosophers. Bird got a fly, fish got to swim, human got a what? Well, okay, let's be a little more specific than that, be human. So what I want you to do is just think about that, come up with an answer. At the end of this talk, I'll tell you my answer, uh, and we'll talk about some of yours. So a bird got to fly, fish got to swim, human got a blank. Be creative. Be, okay, so hold us. So hold, but everybody, seriously, think of something. Think of an answer so that if I cold call on you, you'll have something to say. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the humanities are the oldest branch of human inquiry, especially if we include epic poems and sacred texts. Uh, but in the last hundred years, there's been, since the flowering of the social sciences, there have been so many more opportunities for consilience. Consilience is a, a word popularized by E.O. Wilson. It means a jumping together, a coming together of different branches of knowledge. <clears throat> uh, one of the great insights that I think is common to all the humanities is that stories matter. We think in stories, we teach in stories, we understand things best in stories. Pretty much anything you want to explain as a teacher, if you put it in story form, it goes over better, it's more memorable than if you simply explain uh, the facts. Stories are, are our natural vehicle for self-understanding. Uh, so actually inspired by the title of this, uh, of this series, I, I, I was gonna just sort of rearrange you know, some of my old lectures, which is what almost all speakers do. Um, but I actually decided to, to start from scratch and write a, a new talk, really trying to tell the story of humanity as a story, a story in which moral psychology plays a starring role. Um, so today I'm gonna tell you the, the story of humanity from the point of view of moral psychology. And I think it's a really compelling story and an inspiring story and even a kind of a miraculous story. I think it's, it's miraculous in that out of the millions of species of life on earth, we're the only ones that discovered morality and that used it uh, to, uh, to create moral communities. Once we had these moral communities, we broke out from every other species, we conquered the earth, but we didn't just dominate it and overrun it, we also got to the point where we can actually worry about our dominating and overrunning it, and we can begin to take some measures to undo the effects of our amazing success. Um, so it's a miraculous story in that it runs from something like this, I mean, these are chimpanzees, the common ancestor is not exactly a chimpanzee, but something like this to something like this. These are hunter-gatherers, these are cave paintings by hunter-gatherers who rarely painted themselves, but occasionally get images, um, to something like this, uh, living in uh, now suddenly vast, uh, vast civilizations with a lot of hierarchy, uh, to something like this, people who are willing and able to do something as foolish and time-wasting and symbolic as holding hands all across America. How does this happen? How does a species come to the point where it can do that? Well, that's what our story is about tonight. So to begin, I'd like to start at the beginning. And by beginning, I mean the very, very beginning. Uh, there's a wonderful project at bighistory.com that uh, the, the historian uh, David Christian found a way of teaching history to his students uh, in which he, he, you can zoom in on, this is the entire course of history. He takes the 14 billion years of uh, the universe's history and it puts them onto a single calendar year. So the Big Bang happens, okay, I'll zoom in. So the Big Bang happens on January, you know, midnight on January 1st. And if we zoom in on these first few months, what we see is several transitions. We get the Big Bang, then we get stars, then we get the stars making chemically, uh, making many other elements, not just hydrogen and helium. But all of that happens basically on January 1st or 1st and 2nd. Um, and then not a lot happens. You just get more elements, but not a lot happens for billions and billions and billions and billions of years. And then in the autumn, we get a little bit of happening. We get uh, the planets, uh, our planets beginning to form. Uh, and soon after the planets form, we get life. So threshold five life on Earth. Uh, we, uh, so those are two more thresholds, but still those are pretty spaced out until we get to December. And in December, in the last couple days of December, all hell breaks loose. Um, <coughs> So uh, um, let's see, I think I have rough, uh, approximate dates here. Okay, so uh, we get multicellular organisms, we get life leaving the sea, you see that indicated down there in early December, early to mid-December. Um, and then 
uh, bang, 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 in the last day, we get three more thresholds. Actually, not just the last day, the last minutes of the last day, we get three more thresholds. Around 11.54, I just did, used a calculator to approximate this, at around 11.54 on December, p.m., on December 31st, the, uh, um, the, uh, that's when human beings appear. Um, and at 11.59 a p.m. on December 31st, humans invent agriculture. And then at 11.59 and 59 seconds, we get the Industrial Revolution. Um, and then we begin changing the Earth's climate, and that's the Anthropocene era. <clears throat> so this kind of puts things in perspective, doesn't it? Uh, this kind of makes it all seem rather miraculous. Something was happening here. Look at all these transitions. On the very last day of the year, uh, something as miraculous, I would suggest, as the moment of creation, when you had also many thresholds happening, uh, one, one, after, one right after the other. Um, so what is it? What happened? Let's listen to David Christian explain. I, the, he has a, uh, what, how do we get these three thresholds? So he gave a TED talk. If you just go to TED.com, you can see his talk. And I've edited out the last three minutes of it. This is where he narrates how human beings did it. Or, so here we go. For most of that time of life on Earth, living organisms have been relatively simple, single cells, but they had great diversity and inside great complexity. Then from about 600 to 800 million years ago, multi-celled organisms appear. You get fungi, you get fish, you get plants, you get amphibia, you get reptiles, and then of course you get the dinosaurs. And occasionally there are disasters. 65 million years ago, an asteroid landed on Earth near the Yucatan Peninsula, creating conditions equivalent to those of a nuclear war. And the dinosaurs are wiped out. Terrible news for the dinosaurs, but great news for our mammalian ancestors, who flourished in the niches left empty by the dinosaurs. And we human beings are part of that creative evolutionary pulse that began 65 million years ago with the landing of an asteroid. Humans appeared about 200,000 years ago, and I believe we count as a threshold in this great story. Let me explain why. We've seen that, we've seen that DNA learns, in a sense. It accumulates information, but it is so slow. DNA accumulates information through random errors that just, some of which just happened to work. But DNA had actually generated a faster way of learning. It had produced organisms with brains. And those organisms can learn in real time. They accumulate information, they learn. The sad thing is, when they die, the information dies with them. Now what makes humans different is human language. We are blessed with a language, a system of communication so powerful and so precise that we can share what we've learned with such precision that it can accumulate in the collective memory. And that means it can outlast the individuals who learnt that information and it can accumulate from generation to generation. And that's why as a species we're so creative and so powerful and that's why we have a history. We seem to be the only species in four billion years to have this gift. I call this ability collective learning. It's what makes us different. We can see it at work in the earliest stages of human history. We evolved as a species in the savanna lands of Africa, but then you see humans migrating into new environments, into desert lands, into jungles, into the ice age tundra of Siberia, tough, tough environment, into the Americas, into Australasia. Each migration involved learning, learning new ways of exploiting the environment, new ways of dealing with their surroundings. Then 10,000 years ago, exploiting a sudden change in global climates with the end of the last ice age, humans learned to farm. Farming was an energy bonanza, and exploiting that energy, human populations multiplied, human societies got larger, denser, more interconnected, and then from about 500 years ago, humans began to link up globally through shipping, through trains, through telegraph, through the internet, until now we seem to form a single global brain of almost seven billion individuals, and that brain is learning at warp speed. And in the last 200 years, something else has happened. We've stumbled on another 
energy bonanza in fossil fuels. So fossil fuels and collective learning together explain the staggering complexity we see around us. So. Ah, so, so that's, that's how you do it. If you, if you get uh, fossil fuels and, uh, So fossil fuels and collective learning together explain the staggering complexity we see around us. Well, that explains it, doesn't it? Actually, that, that kind of explanation, not to take anything away from the project, it's a fantastic project, but that actually kind of reminded me of, of this whole thing First, Python here's skit. Jackie it's a show called How, how You Do It. the world of all known diseases. Let me, sorry, let me start that again so you can hear it. So, so he says, here. So it's a Monty Python skit, a TV show, How You Do It. Okay. First, here's Jackie to tell you all how to rid the world of all known diseases. Hello, Alan. Hello, Jackie. Well, first of all, become a doctor and discover a marvellous cure for something, and then when the medical profession really starts to take notice of you, you can jolly well tell them what to do and make sure they get everything right so there'll never be any diseases ever again. Thanks, Jackie. Great idea. How to play the flute? Well... Here we are. Um, you blow there, and you move your fingers up and down here. So. Um, so I think we need to go a little deeper than fossil fuels and collective uh, learning. In fact, um, I'm going to argue today that language isn't the breakthrough. Uh, language wasn't the key innovation. Language is not even possible until another key innovation comes about, which I'll tell you about. Um, Language was just part of a larger transformation, the transformation that took us from sociality, we're, we're social species, all primates are social, uh, to ultra-sociality, an extreme level of sociality uh, only found otherwise in bees, ants, wasps, termites, uh, and other such animals. Um, and uh, so let's zoom in on this, uh, this transformation here. Humans appear learning collectively. How did that happen? Uh, well, that's what my book is about, at least the third part of the book. Here's the cover of the American, this is the American hardcover, this is the UK hardcover, which I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm, I'm fond of that, but I'm very glad it didn't appear here in this country. Um, and then this is the US uh, hard, uh, paperback. Uh, the book is structured around three ideas, three principles. If you understand these three principles, then you understand moral psychology. <clears throat> uh, so uh, the first two I won't really talk about tonight. Intuitions come first, strategic reasoning second. Uh, that's on my, my original research was on how we basically have gut feelings, intuitions, and then we make up reasons afterwards to justify those feelings. That's why it's so hard to win an argument. That's why nobody changes their mind just because you gave them superb evidence that they are totally wrong. Uh, the second uh, principle of moral psychology is that there's more to morality than harm and fairness. Uh, there's also issues of liberty, loyalty, authority, sanctity. Uh, and different cultures build on these founda moral foundations just as different cultures build on different taste buds in their cuisine. And this helps to, helps to explain the culture war that we have in this country between the left and the right. That'll be the basis of part of my talk tomorrow night. The third principle, morality binds and blinds. That's the one I'm gonna talk about tonight. Uh, this is the one that really helps us understand how we broke out from all other species and became human. So I'm gonna tell you this story now. It's a story in, uh, with eight chapters, eight, uh, eight chapters that tell a coherent story of how we got from uh, an ancestor that was not that different from a, from a chimpanzee, uh, um, to who we are today. And so here's chapter one, rising up. So once upon a time, uh, there was an ape, well, there are many different apes all around Africa, but there was one of them uh, that began not just knuckle walking. I mean, ape chimps can stand on two legs, but they prefer not to. Um, it, 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 there was a species that began not just sort of knuckle walking like that, but actually uh, standing up a lot more. This is, this is actually a bonobo. Bonobos don't really walk upright, but they can. Uh, they're much better at upright walking than our chimps. Their bodies are actually more similar to ours, as you see from the proportions. They're more gracile. They have longer arms and legs, uh, much like us. Uh, so we don't know what the common ancestor looked like. It probably was somewhere, it was not, probably not too different from, from one of those uh, two models. But this is act one. Well, we don't know why, whether it was uh, because they had come down from the trees and they, it was beneficial to see over the grasses or because there was some benefit to carrying things. But for whatever reason, 
once you become bipedal, your hands are free. They're not structured for locomotion. They're actually much better now at grasping. And so uh, evolution selected for better upright posture and bone structure, better upright walking, until there were species known as Australopithecines that were fully bipedal. And this is the famous Lucy skeleton. This is a reconstruction of what Lucy might have looked like. Now, it's important to note that these, these creatures um, they don't, don't appear to be really different from chimpanzees in their tool use. Chimps will use tools and they will make tools out of twigs or things like that, but they don't make tools out of stone. They're not great tool users. And there's no evidence that Lucy or Australopithecines were either. We should not look at these as early humans. We should look at these as apes that just happen to walk upright. Um, that's just a physical transformation. Then in chapter two, we start getting mental transformations. Uh, around 2.4 million years ago, the fossil record shows that cranium cases, the brain case, doubles. It gets much, much bigger. Brains are now much, much bigger. And at the same time, we find clear evidence of tool making, stone tools. As you see, they're, they're, they're very simple. They're just, you take a rock, you smash it until you get a sharp edge, and then you have a sharp edge that you can use to butcher meat, to do various other things. So uh, archeologists call this the Olduan toolkit from, found at Olduvai Gorge. Uh, so Homo habilis is the key exemplar, also Homo erectus, a variety of Homo species. Um, in fact, the change is so big that uh, this, is, uh, this is a new genus. So Australopithecines was, a, was a, a different genus, and then once you get uh, Homo habilis, Homo is the new genus. That's our genus, Homo sapiens. So we get a big change uh, I here in chapter two, um, and they don't just stop with those tools. The tools actually, over the next half million years, get much more beautiful, much sharper, much, they're much more finely tailored. Uh, well, that's very encouraging. Wow, they're tool makers just like us, and those are really kind of beautiful, aren't they? Maybe they're sort of like us, but then they go and do something which is totally unlike us, which is nothing. <laughs> nothing. This is, what, this is what Akulian hand axes look like for over a million years. This is what they look like in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Now, that couldn't happen with any vaguely human species. If humans invent a teapot, in England, boy, will it look different by the time it gets to China, and it will change every century. But these don't change, which is weird. And so some people think that the knowledge of how to make these tools became innate in the genes, just as beavers know how to make dams in their genes. They just have the instincts to make them. And so these tools are interesting because they're clearly made by a kind of intelligence, but they don't vary. So this is not really us yet. And then we get to the key act. This is the most, important, uh, uh, the most important chapter in the whole story. This is the Rubicon. Uh, most of you know the metaphor, the illusion. Uh, when Julius Caesar, you know, success, a successful general in France, uh, he's coming back to Italy, and Roman law forbade generals to cross the Rubicon River into Italy proper with their armies, because that was such a threat to the government in Rome. A successful general can come and, and and uh, take over the government. So that was the rule. You, it is an act of subvert, sub sedition, it is treason, if a general crosses the Rubicon with his army. And uh, Julius Caesar uh, does it. Um, I think it was 49 BC, I believe. Uh, let's see, yes, 49 BC. And uh, the lore is that when he did it, when he crossed the Rubicon, he is supposed to have said, Iacta uh, uh, est alia, the die is cast. You know, he's rolled the die, whatever happens is gonna happen. You can't turn back now. And of course, he goes on, uh, 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 takes over Rome, Pompey flees, he becomes dictator, setting up a, a massive change in Western history in the, in the Roman Empire, the, on our way to the, from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire. So a real turning point. No way back. You can't go back at that point. That's what Homo heidelbergensis is. This is the first species in which there's clear evidence that they tamed fire. They had hearths. Now, if you've ever gone camping, it's hard to keep a fire going by yourself. And if you have saws and tools, you can do it. But um, the fact that the, this species had fire and they made spears, they didn't just break rocks. They, they tied rock, pointy rocks onto sticks and now they had a throwing weapon that could kill at a distance. This means they clearly had a division of labor in which men were hunting medium to large game uh, and bringing it back to a central campsite to butcher, cook, and share. And if that's happening, then this species had shared intentionality. And that is the Rubicon. That is the key innovation of our species. Let me explain. 
This is work done by a developmental psychologist, Michael Tomasello, uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. He's, he's American, but he works uh, in Germany. And he studies how children develop cognitively and how chimpanzees develop cognitively. And he looks at the differences in the developmental paths and what the abilities of the two species are. He gave uh, uh, some talks at UVA where I, was, I, I taught for 16 years. He gave some talks there about five years ago. And he just he said this offhand comment. He said, it is inconceivable that you would ever see two chimpanzees carrying a log together. And that just blew me away. Because chimps are really, really smart. They can deceive others. They have theory of mind. They can make tools. They can kill. They can learn language using symbols. They're really, really smart. So why can't they do something simple like that together? And here's Tomasello's explanation. Um, this is a, it's a complicated graph from one of his important papers, but it's just meant to show a person who has a goal. This is, this is supposed to be a mental representation. Here's a, he wants to open this box. He has a key in his hand, let's say. And so he says, I want to open that box. He's got a representation of his goal that is an open box. I want to get that box open. That's what I want to get to. And here are the tools I have, and here are the different states, here are the transformations. And he, can, he doesn't have to just stab at the box. He can run it in his head. He can think, well, what happens if I do this? What happens if I get another tool? He can do all that. So can chimps. Chimps are really, really good at solving physical problems like this. Here's what chimps cannot do. We want to open that box. We have these tools. Chimps cannot do that. They cannot share an intention so that they're both working on something together. They cannot do that. Let me show you one of, uh, so here's one of the points that Tomasello makes. You can see the transformation in, our, in the whites of our eyes. Why do we have whites in our eyes? It's of no use to us. It gives away information. What if I see some bananas in a tree and I look at it and you see me looking? Now you know where I'm looking. Now maybe you'll get the bananas. And that's why chimps' eyes don't give away any information. But humans do because we evolved to broadcast our intentions, to make it easy to cooperate and share. We need to share information with each other. That makes us good partners. We are designed to do this, to work together. Here is the amazing experiment that Tomasello did, uh, Tomasello and his colleagues uh, did, to demonstrate this. This was published in Science in 2007. Um, so uh, I'll just set it up for you. Um, so he, they used three-year-old kids and adult chimpanzees. They also did a separate replication with orangutans. And they gave them a series of problems to solve, simple problems that didn't need language. So they could do this, pretty much the same task with a kid and a chimp and just see who, who's better, who's smarter, who's better able to solve these problems. Half the tasks, or a little more than half the tasks, were physical tasks. You don't need any joint, to joint intention, joint, uh, any of that. So here's a simple one. It's obvious. Tool use. Yeah. You give right, I got the, give the chimp a problem. He wants the food. You put down a stick. You don't tell him what to do with it. You just put the stick down. And they're really smart. They, they can do things like this. Even the very first time. I mean, they can figure out stuff like this. They're good problem solvers. Good tool users. Okay. And trust me, children can do that too. Okay. Um, okay. But now, here, here's, here's a social task. Now there were a bunch of tasks in which to succeed you had to understand that the experimenter was trying to convey information to you, was, was trying to direct your attention someplace. You had to read her gestures, her eyes, her intent. So take a look. Um, so the experimenter is going to point to something. So you put a cup, so you put a little reward under, one of the two cups has a little reward, you yeah. take off the glass. The kid looks at them. Now look, the kid looks right at the experimenter's face. She's making eye contact with the experimenter. Now look what happens. The experimenter's pointing and looking, pointing, pointing. And the kid reaches directly for the one that she's pointing to, because it's easy. She, you know, which one should I pick? Oh, that one? Okay, that one. That's easy. Okay, now here's the chimp. Now on Thomasella's website, you'll see the chimp actually succeeds, but that's only because Thomasella chose videos to show that it's within the chimp's capability to solve the problem. But if you look closely, you'll see it's actually random. The chimp uh, can't know where it is and never looks at the experimenter. So even though in this video the chimp seems to succeed, you'll see the data in a moment. They're actually at chimp. Okay, so it's hidden. The chimp can't know where it is. And the chimp never looks at the experimenter. Just sort of, you know, looks all around, looks up, reaches around, I want it, I let me grab in, I want it. 
and he happens to be over there, so he reaches for that one. Okay? But he never got information from the experimenter, even though it was there. The experimenter was pointing, but the chimp never even looked. Um, now, here's the data. So on the physical challenges, it's a three-way tie. All right, the orangutans are a little bit slow, but the chimps and the, ch and the, ba and the toddlers got uh, about 70% of the tasks correct, where chance would be, between, depending on the task, 30 to 50%, something like that, depending on the task. So overall, chimps and human kids totally tied on the physical tasks. And, and orangutans are within the margin of error. But look at the, look at the social challenges. Total domination by the homo sapien. <laughs> The, the, the other apes are actually at chance on these tasks. They have no clue. They cannot solve these, these problems. Okay? So that's the Rubicon. Once you get that, then on the other side of the Rubicon, it, it's like a valley overflown with milk and honey. Then you can have language. Because language is not a relationship between a sound and an object. Language is a social agreement among a community about how we are going to refer to this thing, that thing, that action, that person. You can't have language until you have shared intentionality. And this is why other primates, that while they can learn it, they're not very good at it, and they don't teach it. They never teach it to, to their children. They can't do that, but we do it. Um, and once you have language and shared intentionality, you can do cooperative hunting, foraging, cooperative rearing, and you don't even need language for that. You've all been to a foreign country or some place where they know, you, know, know, you didn't speak the language, but you can actually, you know, you can get a lot done just because you can kind of read each other's intentions. Um, so we don't know when language occurred, but I am very confident it was not before Homo heidelbergensis. It was during this period when they, after they had shared intentionality. Um, uh, and if you have this massive division of labor, then you've got... Um, you've got the risk of free riders and slackers, which means you have to have a moral matrix. You have to have an understanding of a moral framework in which we can punish you for slacking. Otherwise, the, the cooperation doesn't take off. Just by the way, these are actually reconstructions of, of uh, or you know, they're actually, well, pe one of them is people dressed up to look like Neanderthals. Uh, Homo heidelbergensis was the direct ancestor of Neanderthals and of Homo sapiens. So, um, so we we're all very, very, we're very, very close branches on the family tree. So when I say a moral matrix, I mean like the movie, uh, The Matrix, if you've seen the movie, The Matrix. Uh, here's my favorite quote in the social sciences, man is an animal suspended in webs of significance that he himself has spun. Okay, that's from the uh, anthropologist Clifford Geertz. Um, and here's a quote from William Gibson uh, in his book, The Matrix, uh, or whatever it was called, the, the original book. Um, the Matrix is a consensual hallucination. Yep, exactly. That's what social life is. It's a consensual hallucination made possible by our incredible sharing of intentions. We're so intent on doing it that we even watch soap operas so that we can see people violating the moral matrix that we just love to share intentions and do things like this and live in hallucinatory worlds of morality. All right, so that's chapter three. That was the turning point. Um, now, for the next, uh, really continuing up to the present, but I'll focus on from 500,000 years ago until 50,000 years ago, around the time of the diaspora, um, we get gradual change, probably gradual, we don't know, but we get change in two strands. We are biological creatures with genes, and our genes are evolving, but now we're cultural creatures, and our cultural innovations are evolving. Clearly, our tools are evolving. That's the most obvious form. But our methods of social organization are evolving. How do we punish violators? How do we make decisions? How do we govern ourselves? All of these things are changing, and as they change, our genes change. You get gene culture coevolution. Um, so we adapt to living in a moral matrix, and in the process, we get tamer. Human beings show all of the hallmarks of being domesticated. When you domesticate dogs uh, or cattle or sheep, they get smaller, they get dumber, their brains shrink. They get more childlike, they get less aggressive and violent. There are a whole bunch of changes that happen, that happen to us too. Only, we did it to ourselves unintentionally. So look what happens once you're in a moral matrix. Suppose you've got some guy who just won't conform. He's very violent, he never shares, he doesn't do his job. What happens? Does he have more children than everyone else? Not if there's a moral matrix going, in which case we shun him or we kill him. You do this generation after generation, and the people who can't fit in, the people who have no shame, no conscience, they get weeded out. You, we tamed ourselves. Uh, our bodies change, our emotions change, our behavior changes. Um, this is all laid out, especially in this wonderful book by Christopher Bohm called Moral Origins. He tells that story. 
Um, we also get much more intergroup competition. So think about it. We now have spears, throwing implements. We can hunt large game, and we're out there hunting large game. But so is that group, and that group, and that group. And who's going to win? Who's going to control the territory? It's going to be, well, the weapons will help decide. But it's not just how good your spears are. It's more how well you coordinate with the others in your group to band together, take risks, have strategy, defeat the others. So you get group versus group competition. And one of the key innovations for that is tribalism. Tribalism is a way of bringing people together, forging them with an identity, a will, a ferocity towards others, calmness and gentleness towards each other, but you can coordinate and be violent towards outgroup members. So we get tribal minds and tribal sentiments. This is all laid out in a wonderful book, not by genes alone, by Pete Richardson and Rod Boyd. Um, and we get uh, basically this ability to circle around any sort of uh, object, uh, have sh things that we have shared reverence for. This is just an animation I had made showing people who are not necessarily kin. You don't have to be kin. This is the great innovation. But once you circle around a shared object uh, or a campfire, uh, it's as though you put a wall around your group. You have boundaries. Uh, and this is the origin, again, of tribalism and our tribal minds. The archaeological record shows that people began using colored dyes and paints, probably for body painting, uh, by about 110, 120,000 years ago. So tribalism it may not go back 500,000 years, but it, 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 it seems to go back uh, more than 100,000 years. Um, during this time, or probably the very tail end of this time, something that we might recognize as early religion or proto-religion becomes a universal feature of tribes. Um, this is laid out in two books, Darwin's Cathedral by Davidson Wilson and The Faith Instinct by Nicholas Wade. Uh, I just want to make a point about, uh, about religion. Um, it's so controversial these days, even the science of religion. There were you know, the new atheists and various books claiming that religion, we did not evolve to be religious. Religion is a set of parasitic memes that gets in our brains and makes us do stupid things like tithing or blowing ourselves up, which are not good for us, but they're good for the religion. Uh, but I think that's the wrong way to look at religion. I'm a Durkheimian. I think Emil Durkheim, the sociologist, really got it right when he said that a religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. So you circle around something, you hold it sacred. Uh, uh, beliefs, and, pardon me, beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community called a church, all those who adhere to them. So for Durkheim, religion is defined not by what you believe. It's by, defined by what you do. You do these things which bind you into a group. That's the key idea here. Morality binds and blinds. You join a religious group or ideological group, any kind of group, you, have in, you intensely believe, and that blinds you to evidence that doesn't fit to, to, to other ideas. Um, so as we develop the ability to circle around sacred objects and principles, it's as though you know, when you run a metal wire through a magnetic field, you generate a current. Uh, that's actually a metaphor that Durkheim used. It generates a kind of an electricity. Um, now, religions, uh, on a Durkheimian point of view, they help groups cohere and solve free rider problems. That's how they evolved. That's why they evolved. Um, Religion is thought to be irrational by some critics because it makes people do things that are not in their interest. Women have to dress in certain ways that are not really practical. Uh, men too, but especially women deny them certain pleasures. Um, uh, Jews and other groups aren't allowed to eat one of the most delicious foods on earth. Um, <laughs> so there's all these, all these forms of self-sacrifice. What's the point? Why do this? Why give up a protein source? And even worse than that, some religions make people flagellate themselves, cause pain. Why do that? That's so maladaptive. Clearly, we didn't evolve to do this. Clearly, this is a pernicious meme system that took over our brains and makes us do bad things for ourselves. At least that's what the new atheists say. Uh, but here's a really amazing experiment by an anthropologist, Richard Sosis, which I think amazingly well supports Durkheim and, and gives the lie to the view of the, of the new atheists. So what Sosis did is he got data on hundreds of communes from the 19th century. So in the late mid to late 19th century, a lot of groups would go off from the city, they would found communes in the rural areas and try to live out an ideology. Um, and half of them, the half of the ones he got at least, were religious, usually some form of Christian, and half were non-religious, usually socialist, so political ideology. And what he did was he just, he was able to tell from the records how long they lasted. You know, okay, they went out on such and such a date, and by such and such a date, it had disbanded. So he had the, that data, uh, data on longevity is what we're trying to predict. And he also had descriptions of their practices, their rules, what did they require. And he counted up the number of costly sacrifices that each, uh, each commune, each, each community demanded of its members. And what this shows, let's look at the secular communes first. Those are shown in gray. 
So the numbers here are the count of how many required this many sacrifices. As you see, uh, so, so this is the communes that required between zero and two costly sacrifices, three to five, six to eight, and you know, all the way to more than 11. So of the secular communes, 27 demanded no or just maybe one or two sacrifice. They were not very demanding. 27. 20 demanded three to five. Only five of them demanded six to eight, and then only one demanded more than that. So they're not very demanding. And if you look at the correlation between how many sacrifices they require and how long, how many months, uh, oh, this is actually, I'm sorry, this is years. So they lasted about seven years on average, seven or eight years on average, uh, and there's no relationship between how much they demand and how long they last. But now let's look at the religious communes. Okay. So here's the full data. The religious communes, well, four of them required between zero and two, and they, didn't last, they only lasted as long as the non-religious communes. But 10 of them required three to five, and they lasted longer. And six required six to eight, and they lasted longer. And five and five, perfectly linear relationship. Within a religious framework, the more you demand, it's things like cutting your hair in a strange way or an unusual way, wearing uncomfortable clothing, cutting off contact with your friends and family, fasting, uh, you know, uh, walking on your knees. I mean, all sorts of stuff which is irrational, maybe painful. Why do it? And if you're in a secular commune and the leader says, now today we're all going to walk a mile on our knees until they're bloody, you would say, why? <laughs> but in a religious commune, you can say either because God told me or this is what we do or whatever it is. Within a religious framework, costly sacrifices make the group last. It's exactly what Durkheim said. So this is, I think, very direct evidence that religion does what an evolutionary account would expect of it. It helps groups cohere and survive. And the ones that cohered and survived went on to have more children, to spawn off uh, uh, disciple groups, and to become the ancestors of we in this room today. Uh, a metaphor that I like to use is that gods are like maypoles. A maypole is a pole in the ground, and then everybody grabs a, a rope or a, or a ribbon, and if you, you, know, you weave, everybody, the boys and the girls move in different directions, you weave a tapestry, you weave a, a kind of a tubular cloth. You make something out of individual strands. It's a great metaphor for building community. Uh, and this, I think, is why circling is so common in religious practice. It's like going around the maypole. But when we do that, we separate the world into good and evil. And this is, uh, again, a key feature of our moral psychology. Morality binds and blinds. All right, now the uh, pace of the story can pick up. Chapter five, once we have these basic psychological and cultural adaptations that work together hand in hand, tribal minds with tribal communities, religious minds with, re with earlier proto-religious communities and practices and beliefs, once we have this winning combination which allows us to be really cooperative and trusting and to create these intense moral matrices within which we can suppress free riding and get everybody to work hard. Now, we bust out of Africa through Israel and from there out throughout the world, very rapidly displacing all other hominid species. Homo, uh, uh, Neanderthals in Europe and South Asia, uh, Homo florens, you know, the, uh, what's it called, the Hobbit in Indonesia, uh, possibly, you know, there, there were a few other hominids uh, out there 30,000 years ago, uh, but they're all gone now. We were just much more, uh, much more effective than they were. Um, so uh, uh, soon after, so we're hunter-gatherers all over the world, um, and then in a surprisingly short period in multiple locations in the world, uh, some of these hunter-gatherers begin to drop seeds and plant stuff and find uh, that that actually works pretty well and then they get better and better at it and then the plants co-evolve with them uh, and as this happens first in the Fertile Crescent and then the Mesopotamia and, uh, and Israel, Jordan, Syria and that area um, and in an amazingly short time after that um, we, uh, amazingly short time after we get farming uh, we get giant cities. Um, so this is Babylon, this is a uh, an image of what Babylon might have looked like in its glory days uh, this is Rome, this is the Roman Forum, of course. So we go from just in a few thousand years, once we get agriculture, we get a huge surplus uh, and we get massive hierarchy. Hunter-gatherer tribes are always egalitarian, but bang, the hierarchy comes back as soon as we get surplus and we get settled civilizations. Um, so that is chapter six. So uh, this at least fits with what, uh, what David Christian said, an energy bonanza, yes, agriculture generated enough food to have cities and then cities set other things in motion. But now here's where I want to disagree with Christian as to what the next transition is. I don't think it's fossil fuels. It's capitalism. Um, 
the East India companies, uh, the Dutch and the British were the first ones to really get the formula. Uh, they didn't have fossil fuels. Uh, they had innovations in corporate law and in finance. They developed legal structures by which men could pool their resources and undertake gigantic missions, not, uh, not as the king, but as citizens. They had a charter from the king. But they could do things, they could cooperate to generate vast wealth, far beyond what people could generate on their own. These were not fossil fuel based, these were legal and institutional novelties. And if you doubt that, look at the miracle that capitalism has wrought on our planet. This graph shows the average per capita income in about seven or eight different regions of the world from the year one uh, all the way up to, the, well, this goes to 1950. What you see is that per capita income was, I think, about three or four hundred dollars. Mean, it's hard to estimate back in the time of Christ what the income was, but, you know, making a, people are basically at subsistence level. So whatever that is, you know, a couple hundred dollars a year uh, of, of, purchase, of today's purchasing power. Um, and, you know, the, here, here we are, the Dark Ages, the Renaissance. Oh, the Americas are discovered. Okay, you see, Europe, uh, Western, this is Western Europe. Western Europe, Spain, and England are getting wealthier here. Now it's up to like $600 per person. Um, now, here we get the beginnings of capitalism, uh, but, they, but it's so far just a few companies, it's not transforming society just yet. Uh, we, get into the uh, uh, we get into the 19th, uh, 18th century, and then we get into the 19th century, and now, bang, look what happens. America now shoots ahead of everybody else. And this begins in the, early, uh, uh, in the early 19th century. Here's Western Europe. So isn't that amazingly dramatic, how, how you know, uh, per capita income, wealth, comfort, shoots up so many times um, over the course of just you know, 100, 150 years there? Now, if you're not awed by that graph, let me show you the next 50 years, which look like that. Okay, so that's what happened. So the, the total wealth that America has generated since 1950 dwarfs all the wealth created in all of human history before then. Um, and Western Europe is only a little behind us. But now look at China and India. Okay, China and India. Now this graph only goes to 2001. If we did it today, I'm not sure exactly where they'd be, but it would be, you know, they'd be up around here. And if we do it again in 50 years, they're gonna be, I mean, I can't, you know, that would be up at like where the satellites are orbiting way up there. Um, now, China and India, they had fossil fuels. They had agriculture, they had fossil fuels, they had factories, but they didn't generate any wealth. Everybody in those countries was at subsistence level. Why? Because they didn't have capitalism, they rejected capitalism. And then what happened? Uh, in the late 70s, China began tenderly, gingerly embracing it, and then in the uh, early 90s, India. And in 10 or 20 years, not even a generation, bang, vast, vast wealth. And they're on their way up and up and up. Poverty is plummeting in those countries, and that's why it's plummeting worldwide. So which would you rather have? Capitalism and no fossil fuels, or lots of fossil fuels and no capitalism? I think the choice, the, the world has made that choice very, very clear. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. So fossil fuels and collective learning together explain the staggering complexity we see around us. I don't think so. I would put it like this. Psychological and cultural innovations that increase cooperation explain the staggering complexity that we see around us. That's basically the argument that Robert Wright made in a very important book called Non-Zero, that history is a progression of increasing opportunities uh, to play non-zero sum games. I would add to what Wright wrote that moral psychology played a very, very important role uh, in that process, that process of constantly increasing non-zero sumness. So where are we? <clears throat> uh, chapter eight, what's next? Where do we go from here? Um, raise your hand. Are you generally optimistic or pessimistic? Or do you think things are going to get better or worse over the next hundred years? Um, let's say in this country. Raise your hand, or let's not say in the world, in the world overall, things can get better or worse. Raise your hand if you think they're going to get much, much better. Raise your, raise your hand if you think they're going to get much, much worse. They're going to be disasters, suffering, misery. Well, there will be suffering and misery, but okay. So actually, so more of you are pessimistic than optimistic. And that's my general predilection. That's the way I've, I've generally been until the last year. But let me show you why I've changed my mind and how I think the last chapter, the next, cha next chapter is going to go. There are some problems. Uh, we all saw versions of this graph, or there was another graph. Uh, CO2 levels crossed 400 parts per million 
uh, in the last couple months. So this is a graph that shows, in, in keeping with our emphasis on big history, this is from 800,000, this is a time of, ho of Homo heidelbergensis. Uh, as you see, CO2 levels, there is some cyclical rising and falling. They've been rising and falling for a long time. And yeah, you know, so they rose a lot recently to there. Uh, and then in the last 50 years, bang. So that is obviously industry. That's burning fossil fuels. And this is causing global warming, and this is going to cause rising sea levels. So yeah, this is a problem. And this is a problem. Actually, I, I couldn't, I mean, I, Pakistan's even more worrisome. Um, we could very well see in our lives a nuclear bomb go off in a very crowded city. And it could well be an American city. This could happen. So I'm not saying all is going to be smooth sailing. Um, but those are the dark clouds. Let me show you the reasons to be cheerful. Um, I, I would urge you to read Steve Pinker's book, um, or at least read the cover flaps, because the book is 800 pages long, so um, <laughs> just read the... <coughs> um, but it really, it really changed my thinking about the general course of history. I mean, he lays it out both with arguments and graphs so clearly. So what he shows is that life used to be just so brutal and nasty um, uh, this is you know, images from medieval Europe, just constant images of people being tortured and hacked to death and, and raped and, and strung up on crosses, just really awful nastiness. Now this graph, this, is sort, of the, this sort of sums it all up. Um, this is a graph showing the homicide, uh, homicides per 100,000 people per year. How many people are killed or murdered each year out of 100,000? Now this is a logarithmic graph. So notice, one out of 100,000, 10 out of 100,000, 100, or 1,000 out of 100. So it's logarithmic. So this drop is actually gigantic. Um, this is the average murder rate for non-state societies, for, for uh, hunter-gatherer societies, for societies with no government. This is the rate. Uh, so it's you know, on the order of 1 in 20. It's hard to believe. It can't be. 1 in 20 men are killed each year. You'd run out of men pretty quickly. But at any rate, the rate is extremely high. I, um, um, and these are some of the most peaceful. Okay? There are uh, you know, between 10 and 100 are murdered uh, per year, per 100,000. <coughs> um, this is Western Europe. Western Europe, if we go back to 1300, was more peaceful than the average, but it was about the same as the most peaceful pre-state societies. It just goes down and down and down and down and down. And note, this is a drop from, you know, let's call, uh, I don't know how to read that logarithmically, uh, uh, what would that be, you know, 50? No, uh, I don't know how to read that. At any rate, that's a lot. And then that goes, if you go from, you know, whatever, 500 to 50 to 1, it's a drop of 99 point something percent. Violence is down over 99 percent. That's incredible. Um, and it's not just history, it's continuing. <clears throat> uh, this is the rape and homicide rate in the USA. We did have a crime spike, which I believe was due to leaded gas. We were all lead poisoned, the baby boomers and my generation were all lead poisoned. But now that that's wearing off, we've got this gigantic drop in crime in the 90s. <laughs> Seriously, and the historic drop in... So look, rape is down, um, rape is down uh, like 90 percent. Murder is down 50 percent. Crime is plummeting all over the world and in the United States. Genocide um, uh, was obviously something of a problem in the 20th century. Well, it's just about over. Um, now, this is the most important one, I think. Well, they're all important, but this is the one that I think really can change the way you think about capitalism and progress. This is the rate of extreme poverty. This is the people living on $1.50 a day or less. So in China, um, uh, back in 1981, before capitalism, 90, 85, 90 percent of people were living on the starvation levels. And once they embrace capitalism, bang, 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 and it'll be zero within 10 years. India, slower progress, but they're also headed towards zero very soon, as is the rest of the developing world. Africa is slower. Africa has other, other political problems. But the trends in Africa, this is, um, these are projections based on recent progress. Uh, the trend is that African countries are also going to reach zero. Uh, by 2030, there will be hardly anyone on this planet living on $1.50 a day. Now, they'll be living on 4 or $5 a day, but then give it another 20 years. It'll be 10 or 20 or 50. And they'll follow the same curves that I showed you for capitalism elsewhere. So when I was growing up, we all wanted to end world poverty. And we all thought that government or charity or UNICEF was the way to do it. But it isn't. The free market turns out to be the way to do it. When countries join the free market, they generate such vast amounts of wealth that everything changes. So what's next? I'm going to look into a crystal ball here, and I'm going to make six incredibly non-risky predictions. These predictions are almost guaranteed to come true. First, there will be more cooperation. That's been going on for thousands of years. It's with the internet, with travel, uh, with multiculturalism, it's likely to continue. I predict there will be even less violence. 
it's hard, I mean, that trend's been going on so strong, as you see in Pinker's book. Uh, there's no reason to think that that's going to reverse. I predict there's going to be less poverty. Not just less poverty, it's plummeting. The poverty rate is plummeting, and it's going to continue to plummet. Uh, and, and part of the reason it's plummeting is this cycle. Um, as we get more education, as countries, as people get more educated, you get the demographic transition. Uh, what that means is the traditional way of being is Malthusian. That is, you have as many children as you can, and then most of them die. And however much food there is, that supports the remaining. That's the way a lot of animals do it. That's the way humans have done it for a long time. But as soon as they get off of subsistence wages, as soon as they get some wealth, some protection, some comfort, some confidence, some other opportunities, and especially for women, as soon as women have some control, some other things to do, some things to look forward to, they choose to have one child, or maybe zero, or maybe two, but not three. And so the population on this planet, it still is increasing, but the rate of increase is slowing. It's like an ocean liner slowing, trying to put itself in reverse. It's slowing, slowing, and slowing uh, by around, uh, estimates vary, but by around 2050 or to 2070, sometime in there, the rate will have stopped. And by 2100, it'll have reversed. The number of people begin going down. And it'll actually be a very big, it could be a big problem. I mean, we can probably solve problems with technology. But, you know, 150 years from now, when almost every country is composed of old people, and because young, young people are having zero or one kids, um, there's going to be a huge problem with underpopulation. Um, as you get more education and wealth, you get rights. People get rights. Poor people don't have rights. Uh, when people have some property, when they participate, they have rights. Um, and I'm going to go out on a limb and predict that there will be even more technological innovation improvement in the future. So much so that our, one of our biggest current problems, the ecological disasters we're sowing, there are lots of technological fixes that can eventually address those. It could be tough going for the next 50 years, but by 100 years from now, I think we'll have solved global warming. So, uh, in conclusion, <laughs> I think our story is going to end happily ever after. Now, Lots of bad stuff could happen. Now, I'm not, I'm not very confident in this, but whereas five years ago I would not have thought this, I now think that the next chapter of the human story, uh, not that it's ever going to end, but the next chapter could itself conclude happily ever after. Um, and so this concludes our tour of human history. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this uh, uh, presentation of big history with a zooming in on the uh, human position within that. Um, and now I'd like to return finally to the question I asked at the beginning. What is it to be human? Uh, bird got to fly, fish got to swim, human got to live in a shared moral matrix, cooperate and compete. We love competition and actually we cooperate best when we compete. That's why we love team sports. That's one of the pleasures of working in a company or corporation is you have competition within units and across companies. So um, we thrive when we live in a shared moral matrix in which we can cooperate and compete and people play by the rules. They're not slashing our tires or you know, poisoning our employees or something. Um, we got to connect and relate. We got to be part of something larger than the self. This is part of our ultra sociality. Um, we are not just selfish individuals trying to amass money. We want to make a difference. Many of you are associated with the University of Oregon. Many of you have been associated with you. What are students doing all day? Yeah, they're studying. Yeah, they're thinking about their jobs. But they're doing all these extracurriculars. They're joining teams. They're starting groups to solve this problem, address poverty, help the homeless. We have all kinds of motive. Young people especially have all kinds of motivations to be part of something larger and to make a difference. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the human story has been going on a long time. Uh, what it means to be human uh, has changed and will continue to change. But what a long, strange trip it's been. Thank you. Thank you.